Oninger, Interim Assistant Dean for Research and Education Services. Uh, the University Libraries Graduate Research Series is a collaboration between the libraries and graduate students and to offer opportunities to graduate students to practice their presentation skills, discuss the research process, and explain how they use library resources. Each semester, students are invited to submit their research for consideration, and a panel of representatives from the libraries and GSS select one or two projects for presentations. Uh, the selected students are also given a cash reward. That's nice, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this morning's uh, presenter, uh, Amen O'Barbery, uh, is a teacher and translator in addition to being a certified teacher trainer at Arizona State University. Amen also received a TESOL certification from Arizona State University. Been a U.S. Ambassador Relo mentor, is that how I say that? Okay. And Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant at Ayn Shams University, oh, excuse me, at the University of North Georgia, excuse me, skip the line. Eamon earned his BA, BA in Czech Language and Literature from Ayn Shams University. Eamon earned his second BA in English Language and Translation from Mizra University for Science and Technology. Currently, Eamon is pursuing his master's degree in Applied Linguistics here at Ohio University where he teaches Arabic and is writing his thesis on travel logs by, most notably, Ibna Fadlan. El Barbary's research, othering and ideology in travel writing, analyzes Risala by Ahmad Ibn Fadlan and travels in Arabia by Bayard Taylor. The research aims to examine how two main concepts, othering and ideology, are linguistically manifested in both texts. The research begins with close readings of both texts to identify major content themes, such as death, sex, food, clothes, etc. Alongside this content analysis of said themes, instances of sense impressions, sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste will also be recorded. Both the content themes and the sense impressions are analyzed for instantiations of othering and ideology. His research helps American students and researchers to see how the American travel writers saw the Arabs and vice versa. This will help to change the stereotypical image of Arabs in the American mindset created by the media. Please join me in welcoming Eamon to the Graduate Research Series. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. And uh, let me start my presentation uh, by the agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, reasons for conducting this research and also uh, notes on othering and ideology and then the methodology. Uh, ideology and othering in Risala, ideology and othering in travels in Arabia, and then the results, and finally, uh, the library source, and then I will open like the floor for uh, Q&A. So, uh, reasons for conducting this research. Uh, there is much research has been done or conducted on Orientalism, but there is actually less research on Occidentalism, which is how the Arabs see the, 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 the other world, not how the other world sees the Arabs. Um, so, uh, my, my idea is that we are in the Middle East, someone coming in, a travel writer coming in, and someone going out of the Middle East. Um, it's a kind of like a view of a stranger in a strange land. And when I mean stranger here, I mean the travel, travel writers, and the stranger land, land are Eastern Europe and the Middle East. It's a kind of like culture communication throughout uh, different times. So, we examine how culture communicated through uh, different times. And this is going to help us like in our current time with all what we read on like newspaper, social media, not to be misguided by ideologies or ideas that we might receive throughout the text that we read. So uh, I'm going to talk first about the classical uh, travel writing and um, through 2015 uh, mentioned that there are differences between classical travel writing and modern travel writing. He said that uh, the classical one focuses on the journey itself more than the destination, since they, they lack like uh, the, 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 the modern means of transportation that we have now. So they actually focus on the difficulties that they face throughout the journey, even more than the destinations. Uh, and also he said like, unlike the modern ones, they rely on descriptive accounts because they lacked pictures, they lacked like videos, the stuff that we have now, so he lacked more on how to describe things. So the language itself is really rich in description. So they use a lot of adjectives, a lot of like uh, senses of impressions, and to deliver uh, what they see to the readers. Um, 
So some notes on ideology, and this is a kind of like the definition of ideology that I followed throughout my research when I conducted uh, uh, the analysis. Ideology is related to ideas, beliefs, and also opinions. And the relationship between these two things is straightforward. So, which means that ideas and beliefs affect our opinions about things. And also the notion of ideology or the definition that I follow here is how the writers hold certain assumptions about the world and beliefs about the world that affect how they see things or affect their linguistic choices by like following how they see things. Um, and also uh, Bandy 2004 said that the writer tend to distance themselves from the other and this distance that happens is actually based on limited knowledge about the other. So when we don't know about the other, we like tend to distance ourselves from them. And uh, Gillespie 2007 states that the tendency to distance between the in-group, which in this case, the travel writer and his group or their group, and the out-group, they comes from the desire to protect ourselves or to protect self. So othering is actually a, a, a technique for protection for the in-group. Uh, also, othering is a pragmatic act that conveys an ideology. So ideology affects othering, affects how we see the other, which is a message that may be intentionally, and this is what I'm going to mention in my research, one of the the, the, the travel writers, Ahmed Ibn Fadlan, intentionally, like his language was intentionally to distance himself from the other. And the other one, we are Taylor, unintentionally distance himself from the other. Uh, ideology also can exist on larger level, like political views, um, our ideas about the economy or like big crisis on the world. And also it can be in everyday situations, communication between people. So this is what I'm looking at, how the travel writer interacted with people in everyday situations. Uh, so the two books that all the data are, are, are actually taken from is Risala by Ahmed Ibn Fadlan and Travels in Arabia by B.R. Taylor. And for this one, I used uh, a book by Idhan 1960. This is the Arabic text, and Idhan has some comments on uh, Risala. And I consulted two translations. The first one is by Fry 2010 and Macintyre 1979. And for Travels in Arabia, I used Thomas Stevenson, uh, as an editor, like the version in 2003. So these are the two research questions that I tried to answer. The first one is how, how Ibn Fadlan and Taylor's, Taylor's ideologies linguistically manifested in the text. And also, how do Ibn Fadlan and Taylor linguistic choices represent the other? So the methodology, uh, it's a qualitative research or, and also the analysis as well. And the main concern, as uh, mentioned before, is how the concept of othering and ideology are linguistically manifested in the text. So I had like some content themes, uh, such as death, sex, food, clothes, habits, and religious practices. And also I looked at the senses of impression, such as sight, smell, sounds, touch, and taste. Because the first thing, like even like with, with us, when we travel to a new place, the first thing that actually attracts our attention are the smells the tastes of the food, uh, and so on. And these content themes and senses of impressions will be analyzed for othering and ideology, and othering marked by the usage of pronouns and nouns and also adjectives. Um, before I start talking about the analysis, I'm going to introduce both writers. Ahmed Ibn Fadlan, he's an Arab travel writer uh, and explorer. He traveled to many different places, such as Egypt, India, and China. And he was sent in this mission uh, by the Abbasid uh, Caliph al muqtadir to help the Volga Bulgar king. Um, so he passed through like parts of Asia, Eastern Europe, Scandinavian countries, Balkans, and Russia before heading back to Baghdad, where he started his journey. He explored the habits, food, customs, and death, sex, and also the concept of purity. So here is uh, the map of. Uh, the route that Ahmed Ibn Fadlan followed. He started here from Baghdad down there. And I'm sorry, this is uh, like in Arabic. I couldn't find the one in English. He started in Baghdad here and he went all the way up to around Moscow. So we can see Kiev and we can see Moscow and Kazan. And this is the Volga Bulgar River. And then he 
went back to look at. So these dots actually are is uh, like are the uncertain roads that he took, but the ones that has a line, this is actually the punitive road that he followed. Uh, so, also, I need to talk a little bit about the Abbasid Caliphate, which is the Islamic Empire that Ahmad ibn Fadlana started his journey during this time. And um, in the year 749, the Abbasid troops conquered the city of Kufa in Iraq and actually defeated the last Umayyad Caliph, Marwan II. So, the Umayyad Caliphate was the caliphate before the Abbasid Caliphate. They defeated him uh, in the famous battle of Zab. And actually, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate witnessed like the, the capital swing between uh, Baghdad and Damascus uh, during the time since 752-1570. Uh, uh, also, the borders of the, 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 the Caliphate, this, these are the borders, if you can see here, it's spread from Spain to the southern part of nomadic uh, parts of Inner Asia. And also, the, the Islamic civilization it changed it from being a Bedouin tribal society to become more internationalized and multicultural and has multicultural dimensions. And then in the year 1285, the Mongols conquered Baghdad, and the capital was actually after this move to Cairo with the hope to rebuild the caliphate after this. And then the Mamluks army of Egypt was able to defeat the Mongols in the famous battle of Al Ain, and they're trying to rebuild the caliphate from uh, Egypt. Uh, but actually what all the historians agreed about that the first three centuries of the Abbasid, where Ahmad ibn Fatlan started his journey, were actually the golden age of the Islamic empire. Uh, but that and Samarra was the culture and commercial capital of the Islamic world, world at this time, and poetry and the translation actually really flourished uh, during this time. So uh, when Ahmad ibn Fadlan traveled to help the Volga Bulgar king, he wrote his Risala in the year 922. And then there is a study uh, that, that Behi conducted in 2006, and he concluded that Ahmad ibn Fadlan was honest about his narrative. And he came to the conclusion that his word choice actually demonstrated objectivity. And he gives these two examples that we have here. When he directly, Ahmad ibn Fadlan, witnessed something, he used uh, verbs like so or her. Like this example that we have here, I saw that the Rahim of Khwarezm were depaced, made of lead, uh, counterfeit, counterfeit, and brass. So when he witnessed something by eyes, he used active verbs. But when he didn't, he used the passive voice. Like this example that we have here, I used to be told that at the time of death, they do certain thing to their chest, the least of which is burning. So Ibn Fadlan's style, from that we can say that Ahmed Ibn Fadlan can be trusted and also can be accurate about his narrative. Um, and we will talk about this in my conclusion because I, I, I proved that Ahmed Ibn Fadlan can't be 100% accurate as Bayin mentioned. So he used two types of comparisons. The first one is implicit comparisons. And the implicit comparisons here mean that the reader needs to have background knowledge of the culture in order to understand the comparison. Like this example that we have, they, neither, they have neither olive oil, nor sesame oil, nor cooking oil of any kind. They use instead these oil fish. And everything that they use in it reeks of fish oil. And the word that he used, Ahmad ibn Fadlan used in his text, reeks, which is zafran in Arabic, it gives a feeling of disgusting and undesirable taste. He could just say, like, it smells like fish. But he used reeks to give, like, really disgusting mm -hmm. and undesirable taste to the readers. Also, he used another type of comparison, which is explicit comparisons. And these comparisons are, like, really direct. And like he uses them to just to draw dynamic pictures to the readers. So he said, like, I saw that they have apples of a very vivid green color and sourer than wine vinegar. Imagine an apple sourer than wine vinegar. How's this like, like gonna taste? So um, 
some facts about Ahmad ibn Fadlan. Ahmad ibn Fadlan, when he led this mission, uh, he was a religious man. So he was actually a religious man sent to lead the mission. And he also was among the elite, the Caliphate knew. So he was rich. He comes from like a rich uh, sociocultural background. And actually, this affected the way had how he perceived and judged the individuals that he met throughout the journey. Uh, so his ideology appears in his linguistic choices, like this example that we have here. They are moreover like stray asses, and they are not bound to God by religion. So when he saw people that they are not believing or they don't believe in religion, he describes them uh, with negative nouns like stray asses, because he disagreed about what uh, they believe in. And also he used to uh, comment uh, with religious phrases to express objections of what he sees. Like the examples that we have here, he was sitting with a man and, and, and his wife and the wife uncovered her private parts and scratched them. And Ahmad ibn Fadlan, uh, like comment on that, he said, I seek forgiveness of God. So he used religious phrases to show objection of what he sees. Uh, so his linguistic choices, I can like kind of like try to summarize it in three things. Descriptive language, which is adjectives and also nouns and pronouns. And we are going to look how he used these three things to other people and distance himself from the other. So uh, he used negative adjectives to label the other such as wicked, dirty, alias, ugly, shabby and mean. Like this example that we have here, he described a man that he met and he said, the next day we encounter the man ugly, countenance, shabby appearance, mean looks, and despicable uh, demeanor, just as we overtake him by heavy rain. So you can see like the negative adjective to describe the other person. And also he used negative adjectives to label the others here. In this example that we have, he had plucked out the whole of his beard and his mustaches, and he felt like a eunuch. So this, the, the Arabic text actually, that's a very interesting translation because the Arabic text, um, he used the word servant. And at this time, all the servants were eunuchs because they were mainly assigned to serve women. So the, translat the translator here, uh, McEnthin, actually give uh, uh, a really like, uh, good translation that, that delivers the meaning that Ibn Fadlan made. So when Ibn Fadlan at this time said, said servant, he knows that the people would understand that it's uh, he meant like uh, a unit. Uh, also, Ahmad Ibn Fadlan used pronouns to distance himself from the other. And Van Diak, 1984, he called these are, uh, he called them demonstrative uh, pronouns or demonstrative of distance. And he meant by this that, that when the writers try to establish a contrast between the in-group, which are themselves, and the other group or the out-group. So uh, he distanced himself from the other group by emphasizing the differences between us who are more civilized and them who are less civilized. Like the examples that we have, we have here. I saw him find a louse in his clothing, he crushed it between his fingernails and licked it. And then he said, when he saw me, good. So you can see like the usage of pronouns to distance and to show like the differences between uh, his group who are civilized and the other group. And also the sociocultural background. And as I mentioned before, he comes from like the elite, like the Caliph retinue. So uh, he used to like look people down because of like, he wasn't used to what he's to see there. And uh, actually, Behi, uh, not Behi, if the hand wrote about this and how Ibn Fadlan was like coming from uh, a higher sociocultural background, and this will, will actually make him like dislike what he sees throughout his journey. So he said, like, when I used to come out of the public path, ah, uh, and this is another point, is that here's an example to show that Ahmed Ibn Fadlan uh, had a beer. Why this is important? Because it's going to explain the next quote. So he said, like, when I used to come out, of the public path and enter my house, I would like, I would look at my beard and find it have been frozen into a solid. 
This explains why he disliked people who shave their beards in the next quote. So he said they shave their beards and they eat lice. So for him, shaving the beard and eating lice was almost the same disgusting. Like, like both of them, he didn't like. And then the last thing is um, the concept of uh, purity. Not the last thing, but the one before the last. The concept of purity. And also he evaluates people's um, practices, uh, especially when it comes to hygiene accor according to his standard. As we can see here in this uh, description, he uses some negative adjectives to describe the people. And finally, he said that they are like asses who have gone astray. Um, and then also Ibn Fadlan, um, and this is one fact about him, he lacked knowledge of any foreign language. So he hired interpreters throughout the journey to, to translate for him different languages. And this might be the reason that he actually observed the phonological sounds and associated them with negative adjectives. Like these two examples that we have here. Uh, he said that their speech is like a clamor of a starling. And about another group, he said that their speech of all of things is most like the croaking of frogs. In our current time, like more othering when it comes to language is more about accents. But for Ibn Fadlan, it was about the phonological sound of the language itself. And then we move to uh, B.R. Taylor, which is the other book that I examined. Uh, B.R. Taylor is uh, an American diplomat and journalist and a travel writer. He traveled to Europe, uh, Asia, especially China, Japan, Africa, um, Egypt, and Central uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. And then when he wrote this book, Travels in Arabia, he travels to Yemen, Hadramaut, Mecca, Medina, Oman, and other places in the Middle East. He explored the Bedouin lifestyle, religious practices, traditions, and cultures. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the American society during this time when he started his journey. Um, more in 2006 states that, even if, uh, that the US during the 1840s to the early 1860s witnessed significant growth in society, health, and education. And also, the travel writing at this time reached its peak actually of popularity in the 19th century more than any other literary genre. And the reason for that, it, it was actually the, the development of transportation and also uh, communication, especially the telegraph, uh, which actually helped the travel writers to travel to different places and the genre itself to flourish. But Edward Said, uh, he mentioned something about the Orientalists who went to the Middle East, especially during the um, 19th and 20th century. He said that the area on Orientalists shaped the image of the Middle East in the European mindset, and I mean, like, he means also the American mindset. Um, because he describes the Middle East as a kind of, like, mysterious place, and also they focus on, like, the Arabian Nights and how, like, women are sensual objects for male pleasure and so on. Uh, and he said that Edward Lane in the 20th century used the same narrative of Orientalism that actually was before in the 19th century. So he followed the same uh, thing. And more on 2006 states that the Orientalists, especially Edward Lane, may contribute in shaping Taylor ideology, which is a cover writer uh, that I examine um, his book. So I'm looking also at Taylor linguistic choices when it comes to descriptive language, nouns, and pronouns. Um, the difference between Ibn Fadlan and Taylor, Taylor was a journalist, so he used to uh, write his travel writing for publications in newspaper. So he used to write to, to kind of like uh, use thick descriptions, like rich descriptions to create visual images to the readers. And he did like the scene as any travel writer does, which is positive self-representation and negative representation of the others. And we have an example here of like describing coffee. He used to describe things that he uh, sees to what he experienced before in his home country or the visits that he has done or previous travels. Like this one, he said that uh, 
the coffee to this crop is always inferior to uh, to that of the first. You can bring the two types of coffee that he tried um, uh, with the one that he tried before. And also his adjectives. Um, we can see that Taylor's group, he used positive self-representation, described them as intelligent or handsome, which is positive adjectives. And the other describes them as being like annoyingly curious and also barbarous, savage. Also, he used the noun to a kind of like negative negatively represent other people. So he described a group of people here as they turn it around us upon us like wild cats. Describe them like wild cats. And also he used the pronouns as Ibn Fadlan did before to distance himself and his group. He described a man here as a dog or like he's he's an obed sneak about much like a dog who has just received uh, a peating from a fifth on his answer, he delivered it in a most submissive tone. So we can see like the differences, uh, the usage of pronouns to a kind of like negatively represent the other person. Also, he used overgeneralization. He talked about uh, a city that he was about to enter and people told him that it's dangerous to, to enter and he was just um, reporting or telling what the locals told him about the city but still, still, it's still offering about an overgeneralization about the people of the city. He said that a man must either go armed, he means when they enter the city, uh, to the teeth or as a beggar with a claw, in order to be safe when entering the city. And also he used a kind of like a Christian Muslim distinction. So when he referred to the Middle East, he referred to them as the Muslim world. And when he referred to Europe and the United States, he referred to them as the Christian world. As examples that we have here, it remained uh, comparatively unknown to the Christian world and in reference to the United States and Europe. And also, uh, one of the differences between Ibn Fadlan and Taylor is that Ibn Fadlan used to comment on things. But Taylor, since he was aiming to publish this in newspaper, he didn't actually comment on what he sees. But he described it with rich description and leave it to the readers to actually make their own judgments. Like the examples that we have here, I'm going to give you like maybe just read it and tell me how do you feel about this? You receive it positively or negatively? Would you like to try this food or not? No, so he didn't actually say it. He didn't comment any negative thing about the food, but his description actually implies a kind of like negative feeling to the reader uh, and delivered his message. So, and this is a style of, of Taylor, which is different than Ibn Fadlan. Ibn Fadlan was more explicit. Taylor was more implicit. Uh, so here are the findings. Uh, we have two different writing styles. The first one, Ibn Fadlan, is more straightforward. And it was actually aimed his book as a governmental report. It was meant for like a travel writing book. Um, so it's straightforward. There is no like much description. Unlike Taylor, who like his write his writing aimed to be published in newspapers, so it's rich in details. It's rich in details. Their ideologies resulted in seeing different things than what they have uh, like uh, used to and received these things negatively. Um, Ibn Fadlan, their ideology affected also their representation of other people and their cultures. Um, so we can see that, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that Ibn Fadlan, since his ideology affected his linguistic choices, there might be some bias in his narrative, though he can't be 100% trusted. Uh, they actually share some common characteristics as well. They come from richer, more powerful cultures than the places that they visited. And uh, the religious ideology, ideology, they also share this. However, Ibn Fadlan was more explicit with his comments and Taylor was more implicit about his uh, ideology. Uh, they differ in, as I mentioned, like Ibn Fadlan comments 
Uh, also, Ibn Fadlan was more explicit uh, in describing the other. So linguistic choices was like more aggressive, vulgar, um, pejorative than Taylor. Taylor aimed to publish them in newspapers, so he was carefully choosing his um, words. And also, Taylor doesn't comment in any events and leaves the judgment to the readers. And the traveler uh, character as well differs. Uh, Ibn Fadlan lacked the knowledge of any languages, so he had he needs to have someone as a mediator between him and other people. Taylor spoke Arabic fluently, and also uh, clothes like uh, Ibn Fadlan wore the same clothes as he used to have in his hometown back there, but Taylor used to dress like an Arab and hide his identity as a foreigner. Ibn Fadlan didn't actually hide his identity as uh, a foreigner. And then when Taylor came back to the United States, he started giving lectures dressing in an Arab cloth about his travels in uh, the Middle East. So the limitation of this study is that travel writers often exaggerate, and Ibn Fadlan and Taylor are no exception, because they always seek trying to catch the reader's attention with exaggeration sometimes. And I also examined only one word for each uh, writer. And at certain age of their time. So their other than ideology techniques may be changed later on when they did more travels. So com uh, like studying other works for these uh, two writers will help to understand. Is it actually common in all their travel writing that the other people and their ideology affected or it was only in these two books? Maybe in other books they use different othering techniques than what I found. So this is going to be like kind of like future research. Uh, and then we come to the library resources. Uh, so the first time I came here when I started actually working on this research, um, I met a linguistic uh, subject librarian, uh, Jeffrey Chain. I, I, I booked actually an appointment with him and I uh, discussed my project. And since I'm working with uh, like really old texts, it was hard to find resources in order to write my bibliography and also write my literature. He was a great help for me because he guided me with like how to find articles. We had a kind of more than one meeting actually. And uh, he introduced me also to uh, the library tools such as Article Review and Ohio Link. This was like when I started last year my research at the beginning, at the initial stage, to find researches for my uh, research. Uh, and then also I used the article uh, plus. Uh, which is a kind of like amazing and interdisciplinary tool because my research combines different things. My research combines linguistics, literature and the translation. So it's like more than one thing. It's an interdisciplinary, uh, like I would say, uh, field of research. So he allowed me to write like to find books, peer reviewed um, articles from Ohio University libraries and which actually was really beneficial when I did the stylistic analysis and also when I find uh, more studies on Ibn Fadlan and Taylor. And especially Ibn Fadlan, it was uh, a kind of like challenging to find a uh, study uh, on his work, Risera. Um, also, I used Ohio Link because um, it was it's really convenient when I find like when I, I get the work from other over then 100 like curries throughout Ohio, so it's, it's it's really fascinating. And then get the book here from um, like the pickup location at Alden. Um, it's an amazing option for graduate students that help them to uh, kind of like give the resources that they need to conduct their, re their research. And that's it. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, thank you. Just curious, did you do any sort of like like counting of common terms? Like, you know? yeah, that, that's that's something that I considered at the beginning mm -hmm. of of counting the com the common uh, terms and pronouns as well. But I found out that it's not going to actually affect the research okay. itself because you, the usage of pronoun itself doesn't mean that it's othering. So it needs right. to be in context. So that's why this was the initial part of my research. I was doing uh, a mixed method research. I started with like looking at the most common, but I found it's not going to really affect the results at the end because the usage of words need to be in context. 
sure. which is the pragmatic act itself. Okay. I was just thinking like if you counted like, you know, the terms like, you know, dung and camel and, you know, the, the derogatory terms that you, you saw in your descriptions, like how frequent they might have occurred, yeah. you know, so, I mean, we, you could have done something like basically take a whole scan of the whole book, you know, or yeah. find, a, find an e-version of the book and then and then do searches for the terms and do, you know, content analysis that way, which would have been Yeah, I, I, I looked at this using in vivo and, and Kong as well. Uh -huh. So I did it, but it didn't like lead to like really um, a kind of like significant okay. change in the It wasn't results. meaningful to you. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't okay. like, but maybe, maybe with other books. So if we are going to combine like different books and see the common terms throughout sure. different books, yeah, that okay. might that might be something for the future. Cool. Yeah, cool. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, we don't have any online questions yet. Why? Why Taylor? I think Ibn Fadlan is well known, but why uh, why Bayer? Why? Because um, I kind of like Taylor, one of the of the he, he's he's the best American traveler, ah. actually, and that who who did travels to the Middle East. So it was a kind of like. Uh, trying to find someone who who like were really in into travel writing, and because Taylor was was a kind of like really interested in the Middle East and the Arab culture, and he spoke Arabic fluently almost as a native speaker, which helped him to get access to different parts of the Middle East. Um, so he was a kind of like um, uh, what do you say like um, an equivalent to Ibn Fadlan when it comes to like traveling travel writing itself isn't like a, as in a, <clears throat> the, as a, his rank as a travel writer is high like if it's when it comes when it comes to like someone who travels to the middle east i would say yeah okay and then uh specific and you're choosing an american there or so I, I think the the british of all like a lot of yeah i meant to choose to choose the american to have someone like related to like uh the american society right now yeah, yeah, yeah. so american travel travel to the middle east which will help to kind of like see how the americans saw the middle east during this time so this was the, the, like the main target and also it seems like the they uh use animals as comparisons a lot yeah they use animals um which is a kind of like negatively represent the others because like it's a common like behavior that people use animals when they want to like insult someone maybe so but also uh the description was was like with animals because it's a it's a very interesting point that ibn fadlan used a kind of like uh, a lot of descriptions of animals that he has seen during his travels which some of them a kind of like if you read the description you find oh what animal is that it looks like really like a fairy like tail animal that you have never seen in life uh, based on ibn fatlan's description uh is there a conscious travel writing tradition that you're picking up there because i know uh, of course a lot of herodotus also very interested in burial practices things like that and, and is that just would, would you characterize it as, as, as just anyone who's traveling usually notices these things or or, or, or is there any, uh, I'm consciously writing about this because people expect me to write about it because they've read other books that write about it? Yeah, this is, this was the case with Taylor actually, because Taylor like read the works and this is one of the studies more on 2006 did, is Taylor was influenced by the Orientalists who traveled before. So we, before he's starting his travels, he was actually has a mindset, an image of the Middle East before going there. So this is one of the things. But Ibn Fadlan didn't do that because it was it wasn't actually expected to travel, and it was a kind of like a, a governmental report that he has to deliver after coming back. So he wrote a kind of like his diaries of everyday uh, like uh, life during his journey. So Ibn Fadlan doesn't really know about. He he sort of. Uh, he doesn't have an expectation of what he's going to see. No, okay. no, he didn't. He was just like try to uh, kind of like uh, report what he sees like throughout the journey. Uh, was it is? Uh, I mean, I, all these questions could be answered by me actually reading it. But uh, was he like uh, looking for like natural resources or potential lines? Like if he's going to the to the Bulgars, that's they're trying to maybe some diplomatic stuff involving the, the 
Byzantium or something, but then going up that far north, is it like, uh, are we hunting for pelts there or? Yeah, so it, it, so this is a kind of like uh, a political situation. It was a kind of like the, the Abbasid Empire at this time wanted to expand their empire. And when they get the call from the Volga Bulgar king for help to build them to build a fort and a mosque at this time, uh, it was a chance for them to actually expand their empire and gain like more areas in, in a new part of the world. So this was the, the aim of the Islamic empire at this time. Um, but where, where, did you talk about like, Ibn, I, I misunderstand the first part of the question, I'm sorry. Like that, that did he like look at the natural resources when he? Right, so the and other instances like, like Lewis and Clark go west and they're looking for, I, well, uh, uh, I would just like the things that that, yeah. the, that the government interested in probably alliances money. Yes, probably. That's yeah. that's 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 true. Thank you. Uh, he actually he talked about this. Is that the 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 Volga Bulgar like uh, kingdom at this time? It was a rich kingdom. So so joining the Islamic Empire is something for like the good of the political like situation at this time. And Ibn Fadlan's like uh, he knows that his risala is gonna affect the, the political decision. So when he wrote, he mentioned this part that it's it's a rich uh, kingdom. Um, also, the, the you, you covered an ideology, the political, it, you have a court writing for a court, and then we have a, uh, well, they're both diplomats, as you said, yeah, yeah. but one's a, a diplomatic in a, in, a, in a monarchy writing for the court, and the other one is, and I don't think he, uh, was, was he going overseas with a portfolio? He's going as a as a reporter, kind of. And so one's a democratic, a, a, a person writing for probably paid by the word sure. for newspapers versus the the court system. Uh, that uh, yeah. So there's the I guess just I'm just yammering on about the, the but the specific political regimes they're writing for. That seems yeah. to very much come out. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of like, um, and also I talked about this during the thesis, which is uh, the power dynamic of like when you come from uh, a rich, powerful empire yeah. to come to less powerful places and you try to a uh, kind of like uh, overtake in these places. And this was the idea when actually of, of like um, civilizing the uncivilized nation during the 19th century when uh, when, uh, what's his name, Taylor started his travel also. This was the idea of the mindset and which was led actually later on to uh, colonizing other parts of the world from like different countries. I know that there's a, a long writing tradition of, of, of going to Jerusalem, like Melville writes about that and all that. So I assume that the, uh, uh, well, some of the, the, the does, he, does he go through the, any of the or Taylor does he, he he doesn't go through the through the biblical sites at all or because uh, he's he's going I think he's, Taylor's going he's going set like he's uh, you know along the edge of the peninsula right Yemen yeah and all that yeah, yeah 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 so he's not going up to one would I would have guessed that the the newspaper reading audience probably wanted writing about the what they're reading, reading about in the Bible but he's not he's not doing that trip he's doing something else. Uh, yeah, he, he's because like they mentioned that travel writing itself at this time right. about describing different parts of the world was a really like genre that people want to read. Yeah. So that's why it was like writing about different nations, different culture. It was something that that actually people are looking for through the newspapers. So this is what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. No. So I. Yeah. Have a question. Well, I have a couple questions. So what what comes next? Right, so you talked about the purpose of the studies to help discuss and uncover how we make generalizations about other people yeah. based on these kinds of writings. How do you follow up with this study? Yeah, I would say like like the language that people use maybe on social media right now, the choice of words. Uh, this is something that we need to like consider because there might be certain ideologies of what we read every day, but we never think about it. But when we look at something like travel writing, which is should be like for entertainment, but and then you still have like ideologies and other different people. Mm -hmm. So it's going to make us like be aware of like what we need more 
that was like a kind of like introducing like the idea of like we think about what we need more than what we do yeah and then you talked about following up by doing more reading by both these authors i guess i was wondering about like doing readings of different kinds of travel writing like fictional travel writing which i consider to be more introspective and the journey is maybe more about the person but i'm i'm curious i don't know kind of an unfair question because this isn't what you did but do you think that the ideologies or the perspectives or the othering would change in a fictional concept yeah uh, maybe maybe it's well yeah. i'm not sure of this answer but i i think yeah maybe maybe it's well yeah maybe this is something that to discover in the future yeah to research. I, don't, I don't know if it would improve <laughs> or, or get worse i suppose it depends on who the person is but. Be an interesting comparison if it turns out that it doesn't matter whether anyone actually went there or not. Right. Well, you could still do fiction based on an experience, right? Like you could actually go someplace and write a travel story, but fictionalize it, I suppose, right? Now, the Montesquieu's Persian Letters actually does this, but it's a political satire thing. Anyway. So is your plan then to next do more readings on both of these? Yeah, letters? this might be in the future research, like looking at more writing of uh, from Ibn Fadlan and Taylor and then com comparing their styles because it might be that later on their actually ideology change it and they see like things differently so it's, it's it will be interesting to see like how like throughout their life it changed because I think when they started their journey they weren't like the same age but Ibn Fadlan was almost 40s Taylor was like late 20s I would say so they are kind of like similar in the age a little bit maybe later on when they get older their view of things change it. Right. I think it's fascinating. I can't remember the name of the author that said that Babylon was sincere. And yeah. And unjudgmental. <laughs> I, th I just think that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> we have no questions from online, so if everyone asked all your questions, I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. No one just came in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so from Lorraine Wachna, she's asking, are you thinking at all of connecting it to the global conversation on racism and systemic racism and how that writing reflects a form of racism? Yeah, that, 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 that's true. It might be like connected to this. Yeah, that's that's true. I have never thought about this, but it's something to consider in the future. Yeah, that's that's something possible. 